I can get closer? Take it off. What? Did you say take it off? (laughs) (laughs) There's a sign up sheet here for that. (laughs) All right. Uh, My name is uh, actually, my pen name is J. North Conway. It's kind of a fancy name that actually my publisher gave to me. Uh, because when I started writing uh, almost 13 books ago, one of the first books I did was a book called American Literacy, 50 Books That Define Our Culture and Ourselves. And this is a true story, because I don't write fiction. I, I don't, it's not my thing. Um, he said to me, Jack Conway is not a good name for an academic book. You sound like you uh, are a detective writer. So we're going to come up with a new name for you, which they did. And they said, we think that this is a very academic sounding, you know, you're a New Englander, so J. North Conway is going to be your name. And uh, just being happy to have something published, I didn't care what they called me. You know? <laughs> I asked them if they could call me Herman Melville, but they said that was taken. <laughs> so I didn't do that. But um, yes, as uh, Victoria said, I go by Jack. And I'd like to thank Victoria and everyone else involved for inviting me here tonight. And I'd especially like to Thank you all um, for coming. I'm, I'm, such, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm actually so pleased to be anywhere. But uh, <laughs> to, to my agent, <coughs> Tris Coburn, up in uh, Camden, Maine, uh, often says that I shouldn't be out in a polite company because I'm a writer. And uh, we have certain uh, characteristics that don't make us the most sociable of people. You spend a long time sitting in alone and writing and so forth. So uh, I, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, this is wonderful. Uh, I won't have to go out for another two years and see anybody. <laughs> but, cool. I'm going to try and tell you five things uh, about uh, the building of the Cape Cod Canal. As you're well aware, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the first canal, which was built by August Belmont and opened on July 29, 1914. The canal we see today came about through the Army Corps of Engineers during the 1930s. I think it was 32 to 35. But Belmont's was the first. It was not as big. It was not as wide. It's not as deep. It was the first, however. And one thing that is absolute in this world is you can only be first one time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about why and how I wrote this particular book. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why it appeared it took so long to build this canal. They were, <coughs> excuse me, there were um, proposals to build this canal going as far back as Miles Standish. I then want to talk to you a little bit about who August Belmont Jr. was, who was the gentleman who actually built uh, this canal. And I want to talk to you then a little bit about the digging of it and the cost of it, and finally the sale of it, which happened in, um, it didn't become finalized until I think 1927, but it began in 1918 when uh, President Wilson made the decision that he wanted the Cape Cod Canal to be a part of America's defense system. So those are the five things. I'm usually pretty good at that, five things. Sometimes it's 105. But I, uh, first of all, I, I want to tell you, let you in on a little secret. I am not a historian, okay? Please understand that. I'm not a historian. I'm a writer. Uh, as Victoria told you, I have more than 13 books out. Good for me, it keeps me busy, uh, keeps me out of the general population. Um, <laughs> And I write about things that interest me. I have been fortunate enough to do that. And the Cape Cod Canal has interested me 
for many years. Um, uh, I will tell you the evolution of it. I'll tell you the evolution from a personal point of view and then from a public point of view. From a personal point of view, basically what happened was that as a writer, at a period of time in my life, long ago and far away, um, I was in between uh, jobs. Uh, that's a euphemism for being unemployed. <laughs> and uh, I used to take my sons, Nathan and Andrew, down to Onset Beach, which is right on the canal. And uh, it was a great beach because it was small and there were no tides and the children could play there and dad could sit on the beach. And um, inevitably, the boys would ask me, you know, Dad, who built the Cape Cod Canal? And uh, of course, obviously, I would say, well, sons, I built it. <laughs> while I was in between jobs. <laughs> but uh, it got me to the point where I said to myself, here I am, <coughs> I come from, a, I'm a, uh, a blue collar writer, I come from an, an old industrial city in southeastern Massachusetts, and when I uh, vacation, which I uh, didn't do often, we would go to the Cape and the canal was a big part of it. And I knew absolutely nothing about how it got there. So that propelled me to want to write about it. Subsequently, uh, I got a job as, uh, in the newspaper business. I had spent 25 years in the newspaper business. I worked as the business editor for the Taunton Daily Gazette. But on weekends, our editors would say, you have to write a feature story to fill up the paper on the Sunday edition because it was a, a big edition. So I one day wrote a 500 word piece on the building of the Cape Cod Canal and it appeared in the Taunton Daily Gazette in the Sunday edition and on Monday we started receiving phone calls from people, lots of phone calls, more phone calls than we'd ever received or I've received aside from death threats. Um, <laughs> and. Um, so uh, I recognized that there was a keen interest in this. I then wrote a 2,500 word article on the building of the Cape Cod Canal, which I was fortunate enough to sell to Cape Cod Life. I took the article, which was about approximately 2,500 words about the building of the Cape Cod Canal, and expanded it and went to this group uh, called Publish America who did this slim volume called Head Above Water, uh, Building the Cape Cod Canal. And from there, uh, my agent uh, approached History Press uh, to do a longer, more sophisticated version, uh, which they agreed to. So that is the evolution of that story. <coughs> it started with my sons asking me, and it had an evolution from which it moved from a newspaper to a magazine to a small, thin book to finally this book. Um, this was published by History Press. They used to have offices here in Massachusetts. Uh, I don't think they have any offices anymore. They're in, now located in South Carolina. Um, they have an agent, I don't see her here, she was here, uh, Danny McGrath, who covers the New England States, and they publish a lot of books about New England, New England history, and so forth. So I've been very fortunate to be uh, with them and for them to do the book. This, by the way, having had done 13 books, this is my most successful book in terms of publishing because it's in its fifth edition. It was originally published in 2008. Here we are in 2014. And those editions that are on the table are editions uh, that came out this year which makes it the fifth edition, and good for me. I got, you know, it keeps going. Now, I had told History Press this. I had told the marketing department this. They wouldn't listen to me, but I told them, look, <coughs> there are estimates that anywhere between one million and three million people come to the Cape 
every summer. And they come and they look at the Cape Cod Canal. And it isn't the same one million and three million people. There are new people who come. So if you have this book out there when they come, each year you're going to have more and more people buying it. Uh, their um, astute marketing department said, uh, really, really, okay. <laughs> and then, of course, as I'm holding this, they went, uh, by the way, uh, who built the Cape Cod Canal? Well, anyways, so I said, <laughs> uh, so, but I've been fortunate to be with them and, and to do, just step aside for one minute before I get in to the real meat of the matter of the um, building of the canal. Excuse me. Um, this is a history press book that I did with a historian, Jesse Dubuque. It's called The Attack of the HMS Min uh, Nimrod, Wareham in the War of 1812. Wareham celebrating its 275th anniversary, uh, and uh, it's celebrating the 200th anniversary of the British warship Nimrod attacking Wareham. So History Press contacted me and asked me to do a couple of books for them. And I, I, I couldn't because I had other commitments, but I said I'd be glad to do one of the two books. Uh, one book was, and, and then I suggested that they hire a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Michael Vieira, to do a book that they were planning called A Brief History of Wareham with a companion piece to this in honor of the 275th. I had worked on another book with uh, Mike Vieira, and uh, Victoria has indicated that if that book ever comes out, I'll, I'll be back. It's called <coughs> The Weather Outside is Frightful, and it's about hurricanes, storms, blizzards that have hit the New England coast, and that's a coffee table book that's coming out hopefully in October. In any event, Michael Vieira signed on to do the book on the brief history. I got a, a very knowledgeable uh, historian, local historian, Jesse Dubuque, who works uh, at Battleship Cove in Fall River. Uh, and uh, as I said before, I'm not a historian, I'm a writer. I go right for the story. I tell stories. I don't make them up. Uh, I tell uh, nonfiction stories, stories that I like. And I've been fortunate enough to tell stories that publishers uh, seem to, to like. So that takes me uh, to now, and that takes me to the, uh, the actual uh, part of it that you're probably more interested in, which is the building of the canal and why it took so darn long to do it. Um, one of the things about the canal that's important to understand is that the idea, not the digging, but the idea behind having a canal cut across Cape Cod, went back to the 1600s. Miles Standish proposed to have a canal. In 1775, there was the first recorded survey of Cape Cod trying to determine whether a canal could or could not be built. In 1776, General George Washington himself proposed the canal for military and trade purposes. In 1791, the Massachusetts General Court proposed to study the idea. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> in 1798, James Sullivan set up a, uh, a private corporation um, for the sole purpose of uh, digging the canal and uh, petitioned the Massachusetts State Legislature. Nothing came of it. In 1801, Thomas Batchelor approached the town of Sandwich and requested from them whether they would allow him to dig through Sandwich land to have a canal. Nothing happened with that. 1803, the Massachusetts General Court decided to study it again. <laughs> it 
the canal. In uh, 1808, then Secretary of the Treasury, Albert Gatlin, authorized a federal survey. They weren't going to be outdone by any Massachusetts surveys. We're going to do our own survey to, to try and determine ways to improve uh, transportation in that area. But his study, the, the 1808 study, did not recommend the digging of a canal. In 1811, Thomas Batchella, who was a, a uh, entrepreneur, resumed his efforts with the Massachusetts State Legislature and with the towns on Cape Cod with a proposal to uh, dig uh, a canal, and nothing came of that. In 1818, Israel Fondike took up the Cape Cod Canal, and he began the Massachusetts Bay Canal Corporation, <coughs> and went to the legislature with a plan to build it, and nothing came of that. In 1860, just prior to the American Civil War, uh, Massachusetts Governor Nathaniel Banks recommended to the Massachusetts State Legislature that steps be taken to preserve all of the surveys and all of the studies concerning the digging of the canal. Not to dig the canal, but to save the surveys in case they had to look at them at some point so they could decide not to dig the canal. It was one of the most intriguing bits of political inertia in Massachusetts history, almost 300 years, with people understanding that a canal would improve transportation, it would save lives, it would be used as a military defense, and it would also be able to save a great deal of money and lost lives, money from insurance companies who were paying off of these ships that were sinking as they sailed around the very treacherous um, farthest points of Cape Cod. So if you ever think that the, dig, the big dig took a long time, <laughs> never. No, 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 no. There were hundreds of surveys and resolutions and plans and charters calling for the building of the canal, and they were subsequently filed and forgotten. <coughs> Even though in each of these studies, whether there were state studies, federal studies, or studies done by private individuals, they all said the same thing, that a canal would be essential to providing a safe shipping route southerly that would avoid the very dangerous sea route around the Cape. There is a report in 1875 uh, by the United States Life Saving Service that called the sailing route around Cape Cod, quote unquote, the graveyard of the Atlantic. <coughs> During the early 1800s, nearly 120 ships per day were rounding the Cape along that treacherous route of shoals and currents. And in one 12-year period, 1843 to 1855, a report indicated that more than 100 ships were lost trying to round the Cape, with more than 100 lives lost at sea, and approximately $1.8 million in property sunk to the ocean's depths. The idea that the Cape Cod Canal would 
reduce the number of ships lost at sea, reduce shipping insurance, increase the speed of the journey, eliminate delays uh, due to storms, and reduce the loss of life and property was well known to everyone, and yet nothing done. That was until August uh, Belmont Jr. appeared on the scene. <coughs> Excuse me. So we are at part three, August Belmont. Now, I say this to you, and all the humility I can muster. August Belmont was a New Yorker, which only adds fuel to the fire between the Red Sox and the Yankees. <laughs> because it took a New Yorker to do what Massachusetts residents couldn't do for 300 years. August Belmont Jr. Uh, was a New York banker and financier. He was a man of incredible, vast interests and accomplishments. He was at that time, <clears throat> at the beginning of 1902, one of the most powerful and influential banking entrepreneurs in the country. The company that he ran was founded by his father, August Belmont, who was, came to America as a representative of the Rothschilds. He was born in New York City in 1853. He was the son of Caroline Slidell Perry, who was the daughter of Commodore Matthew Perry and August Belmont Sr. So we have a connection now because that comes into play in terms of the actual digging of the canal. <coughs> His mother was the daughter of Matthew Perry. August Belmont, Jr. graduated from Harvard University in 1874. And in 1890, following in his father's footsteps, he assumed the control of his father's financial and railroad interests. Along with being a financier, he was an avid sportsman. He was instrumental in founding the Belmont Stakes in New York. He was chairman of the American Jockey Club. And he was also a breeder of race horses. And he was the breeder of one of America's most prized thoroughbreds, Man of War. There is a story that can't be confirmed. It's still a good story, so I told it. <laughs> I'm not a historian. That the young Belmont was an avid runner at Harvard. And while in college, he had found that the shoes that he was using for running did not have enough grip to them. So he is credited, once again, without any heavy evidence, he is credited with inventing the spiked running shoe. Nike hasn't heard of this, but it's true. <laughs> Actually, as the story goes, that while he was at Harvard, he, on the track team, he hired a local shoemaker to put spikes on his shoes to provide better traction, excuse me, 
And soon those spiked shoes became the standard uh, running uh, gear for track teams all across the country. Excuse me. <coughs> In 1904, Belmont financed and built the first subway system in New York City, the Fourth Avenue Subway. He was appalled by the number of uh, trolley lines uh, that, uh, and elevated trains that were uh, cluttering up New York City at the time, and he proposed building an underground train system. And Belmont went on to build the Fourth Avenue subway, and it was built in 1904. It only ran, for those of you who know New York, from 14th to 34th Street. Once again, you can only be first one. <laughs> interestingly, at least somewhat interestingly enough, the engineer that he hired to oversee the building of this first subway project was a gentleman named William Barclay. Parsons. And Parsons had built trains and railroads and bridges throughout the United States. He was appointed to the Panama Canal Committee, commissioned in 1904, to help devise a canal linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans to Central America. <clears throat> His plan did not call for putting the Panama Canal where it is now located, and Teddy Roosevelt at the time decided not to use his plan. Parsons hired a gentleman named Michael Deegan, D-E-G-O-N, um, as the contractor. So we have August Belmont, we have William Parsons, and we have uh, Michael Deegan, all of them working on the underground trolley in New York City. Both Deegan and Parsons later became part of the construction team hired for the building of the Cape Cod Canal. And even though Belmont was a very shrewd businessman, the building of the Cape Cod Canal was more than just a business proposition for him. It was, he had said, to be a labor of love. It was to be a lasting memorial to his, his maternal uh, grandfather, Commodore Matthew Perry, who lived in Bourndale, Massachusetts. In 1853, Commodore Perry opened the doors to trade with Japan when he sailed his battleships into Tokyo Bay. His brother, Captain Oliver Hazard Perry, was the hero of the Battle of Lake Erie in 1813. And very much like Captain Perry on the Battle of Lake Erie, who uttered those famous words, or words that are credited to him, <coughs> we have met the enemy, and they are ours. Much like Captain Perry, August Belmont also met the enemy. Uh, but this time, the enemy was centuries of inaction, lack of money, and millions of cubic yards of sand, clay, rocks, and mud. The history surrounding the building of the canal and the time it took politically to advance this idea was one of the longest periods in the construction of anything in Massachusetts. Along the way of the building of this canal, before August Belmont uh, was involved, there were a series of incidences uh, that 
are worth noting, and they appear in the book. Uh, there was, um, in um, 1880, James Keenan, uh, who worked for a group, a Hardy's Construction, who decided they, they, had to, they had decided to build it but never had enough funding for it, hired um, uh, 100 Italian laborers from Boston to come down and dig uh, the Cape Cod Canal. This was in 1880. This is before Belmont came on board. <coughs> just to lead up to Belmont coming on board. And um, they began digging in Sandwich, Massachusetts, 100 Italian laborers. And after two weeks of digging, there were 400 Italian laborers from Boston and New York working on the digging of the canal. And what became known in Cape Cod history as the Neapolitan Revolt began in October of 1880 when the laborers, 400 of them, that were hired to work, were not paid, were not given food, were not given shelter. They in turn stormed the company's offices in Sandwich and took the son of the company's owner hostage and held them for ransom until they got paid, until they got food, until they got shelter. At first, the Sandwich residents were horrified by what had happened. In fact, they armed themselves and called in other details of police. And according to the Sandwich Register, and this is a quote, Sandwich for, for a week was under arms. But as the truth started to leak out about the treatment of these laborers, the resentment against them diminished. And for several days, <coughs> after releasing the son of the company's owner, they were seen on the streets of Sandwich wandering around begging for food or work or shelter. Finally, the Massachusetts State Legislature intervened with money and the laborers were sent back to their homes in Boston in New York. This very ugly episode in the history of the building of the Cape Cod Canal threw wide open the doors through which August Belmont and his company stepped through. Uh, in late 1909, uh, we'll get into the actual digging of it and I'll give you some, this is part four, I'll give you some information about the actual um, tonnage that came out of there. But in any event, in 1909, Belmont's company began work on a digging of the Cape Cod Canal. This was after so many fits and starts, so many delays. And the digging of the canal was completed in April 1914. There was only a single dam holding back the connecting waters on the east and west sides of the canal. On April 21st, 1914, August Belmont took a glass of water from Bonstable Bay and another from Buzzards Bay and ceremoniously poured them together. Here's what he had to say. May the meeting of these waters bring happiness and prosperity to our country and save some of the misery which the waters of the Cape have caused in the past. <clears throat> and on July 4th, 1914, the 275th anniversary of the founding of Sandwich and the 138th anniversary of Independence Day, the last barrier between the east and west sides of the canal was broken and that once impossible dream of the Cape Cod Canal after nearly 300 years of discussions and surveys and setbacks be 
became a reality. It is today, Cape Cod is an island today because of the construction of the canal. It is one of only, it was one of only a few man-made islands in the world. It officially opened on July 29th, 1914. As I said, work on it began in 1909. It cost $11 million to build. 14 million cubic yards of sand, stone, clay, and boulders were excavated. There were six lives lost in the digging of the canal. At its official opening, it was 13 miles long. It was 25 feet deep and 100 to 250 feet wide. Ships could only pass one way at a time in this earliest version of it. The present canal, the canal that you see today, was built in 1935 to 1940 by the Army Corps of Engineers. <coughs> One of the driving forces behind the actual building of this canal as always, it seems to be in our historical milieu, was money. It was money that insurance companies were losing by boats sinking, that they had to pay for ships and cargo. So insurance companies, because of these financial losses, pushed harder than most to have this canal built. I want to give you a couple more notes here on this. I apologize for this. <coughs> At the time it was built, it was estimated that there was approximately 23 million tons of cargo sailing around the Cape. And the proposal was, because it was privately owned by Belmont, was just an eight cent toll, eight cent toll per ton on the canal would show a profit of approximately two million dollars a year as a financial investment. Belmont ran the Cape Cod Canal as a private venture unsuccessfully. First and foremost, it became unsuccessful because the sea captains who would take their boats around the Cape at least felt they knew the Cape waters and the shoals. What they didn't like was the idea of sailing one at a time through this canal. And several of the boats got wedged and had to be drawn out. So the sea captains themselves said, no, we're not going to use this. We don't want to use it. And so Belmont's investment, a huge investment that he made, <coughs> was for naught. There were a number of things that were built along with the canal. On the east side, there was a huge granite 3,000 foot breakwater that was finished to the north of the opening of the canal. Belmont agreed to build two 
highway walking bridges, which he did, and one uh, railroad bridge. More than six miles of railroad track was laid and more than five miles of new highway was built. Once again, these are not the bridges that you see today. These were the original uh, bridges. Uh, Belmont held on to this private corporation. We are now at Bot Bot. <coughs> Until the start of World War I. At which time, President Wilson determined that the canal should be owned by the government for its strategic military presence. And Belmont did not want to sell it. His investors pushed to have him uh, sell it. The matter went into litigation, into hearings regarding the government takeover of the canal beginning in 1918. It was not until April of 1928, 10 years later, that the sale of the canal to the United States government was complete. It was bought for $11 million, of which Belmont's estate received only $5.5 million. He had invested 11. <coughs> Belmont didn't live to see the sale of his canal. He died in December of 1924. He was 71 years old and when it was sold to the government. And after the takeover by the government, the Army Corps of Engineers were hired to widen and deepen and put in locks for the canal. There is a monument made of white quartz that has been erected, was erected, to the memory of August Belmont, Jr. And many people miss it as you're going over the canal on your first huge hill with the park on your right. There is a ranger station, and then you will see this white Watts Monument. The monument reads, in memory of August Belmont, February 18th, 1853, December 10th, 1924, whose vision, initiative, and indomitable courage made possible the first complete construction of the Cape Cod Canal connecting Buzzards Bay and Cape Cod Bay, which was officially opened for traffic on July 29, 1914, from his maternal grandfather, Commodore Matthew Galbraith Perry, he inherited a warm allegiance to the interests of New England and his deep concern for those that go down to the sea in ships. And that's the end of part five. Thank you for your attention. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Yes, shoot. What did they do with the 14 million cubic yards? They had bridges at the time that carried most of it, some of it out to sea, and some of it into land. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Usually people ask me questions. I have all these notes because I'm, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writer. Uh, yes, right. How long was that canal again? It was uh, originally, uh, the number I'm going from is, I think it was 13 miles. It was eight miles and then two, uh, two and a half on each other end. So that would have made it 13. Eight and 13, uh, five would have been 13. And it was not wide. It was the, the widest point there was 250. The smallest was 100. Yes. Uh, we 
have a, a local interest here. Perhaps you know something about it. Yeah. 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 Rumor is that the Rose yeah. Standish, the first vessel that yeah. the Francis the Cape Cod right. Canal, right. Uh, was no. uh, skippered no. by uh, uh, a Hulls captain. Yeah, I, I, I just learned that today. Uh, Victoria was so kind to inform me. Uh, it's a setup. And, <laughs> it's a setup. and uh, yeah, uh, the Rose Standish was the first ship to the Cape Cod Canal, and uh, it was a hull. Was it life saving? Yes. Oscala James was our Coast Guard. Okay. Uh, uh, the head of the Coast Guard here, and he was in the in the Rose Standish. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And he led all the boats. Yeah, all the boats through there. There were a number, yeah. quite a. To do in there. Once again, as I was going to say, is um, I have all these notes because I teach university, and if I don't have my notes, I the kids sit there and stare at me for long periods of time. <laughs> Inevitably, somebody's going to ask questions that I do not have the answer to. Yeah. So, yeah. forgive me. Go ahead. You noted that uh, Belmont suggested it was whole. Yeah. Was that ever considered by, by the U.S. government as a toll? No, no. They, they did not buy it as a business. They bought it as a military, a strategic military concern. So their concern was to take it out of private hands, to, making, uh, to make a profit, to use it as a military uh, uh, advantage. So they didn't, did not. Belmont did, but it wasn't as uh, financially um, beneficial. There's a hand over here. Yes. The southern part of the canal initially followed uh, a river when they were digging it, uh, a river that came down on the left-hand side. And I wondered if it is the terminus is the current herring run on the, the left side, if you're looking north. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Are the bridges too low now? I I don't I don't know I I you know uh, are they too low now? Really? I I I I wasn't aware of that. I wasn't aware of that. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes. Sir. <clears throat> According to historical records of the uh, East Ham and Orleans Historical Societies, the first Cape Cod Canal was a hand dug body of water they called the ditch. Yeah, Jeremiah's which ditch. Was which it? went from Rock Harbor over into Orleans <coughs> Harbor and was, they took lighters and barges through there with a towpath with uh, donkeys and so on. I don't know how long that lasted, but then you say that was the first Cape Cod. Yeah, that was. I, there was a mention of it and some dates and how it began. And um, uh, I, I will say this, and uh, I'm not supposed to do this, but uh, 2008, the uh, gentleman wrote a review of the book uh, for the Cape Cod Times. And, 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 and this always happens, and it's supposed to happen. And he pointed out the fact that I had placed Jer uh, Jeremiah's ditch uh, in Truro and not in East Ham. And so we, we <laughs> hopefully corrected. It could have been worse. I could have placed it in home. But uh, <laughs> I, I will repeat those words. I'm not a historian. But uh, uh, which I, now I have to hang around with them. Uh, boy, uh, but anyways, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah. So there were a couple of errors, but that was, the, that, that was and that is in, uh, that is in the book. The, the person who reviewed the book for the Cape Cod Times uh, besides pointing out all my errors, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, like I have a wife for that. No, I just kidding. Uh, take that out. Uh, but anyways, the uh, the, uh, 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 the the he also said that Conway jumps around in this book, and that uh, some of the jumping around uh, includes things like how to make real Cape Cod chowder and so forth and so on. And he was absolutely right about that. Uh, the books are up here, but I will tell you this. I, I, I am not, I'm, I'm a non-linear writer. I don't go from A to Z. 
Uh, my agent, Tris Coburn, says that someday, Jack, you'll be hailed as the first ADD writer. <laughs> I have sections that jump around. I do come back to it, you know, but you'll find in this book a lot of information having to do with Cape Cod, having to do with people on Cape Cod, having to do with recipes, the difference between uh, New York clam chowder and Cape Cod clam chowder. So it's in there. I apologize for that jumping around. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, uh, all my books are that way. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm just letting you know that so that when you're reading the book and suddenly it goes, you know, the first space shuttle is like, wow. <laughs> no, I don't go that bad. Good. Also, <coughs> on the canal. Yep, it is. They have a, a place there. Yes, and they were very, by the way, good, good question, Mass Maritime. Uh, they were tremendously helpful in the research, in the photographs, and the sections in helping me put this uh, together. They, they were exceptional. I, I have to say, in the front of the book are a series of acknowledgments, and everyone couldn't have been kinder to this poor soul who was traveling around telling people that Jer Jeremiah's ditch was in uh, yeah, Turo, uh, and they couldn't be kinder and nicer in the writing uh, of this uh, book. If I can give one uh, quick plug. Uh, this year, I had the opportunity to complete, uh, if, if you know what the phrase means, a hat trick. In hockey, it means three goals. Soccer, it means uh, three goals. A hat trick. I had uh, this book came out in uh, early July, the uh, attack of the HMS Nimrod. In September, a book is coming out with Sky Haas Press called uh, The Queen of Thieves. I've done a quartet of books on New York City uh, during the Gilded Age, and this is the final book, and that's coming out in September of this year. And in October, um, the uh, coffee table book the, uh, the Weather Outside is Frightful about New England storms is coming out. So uh, just letting you know that, that it'll be all out just a little bit before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you don't know, yes? You mentioned that, um, that it sold for $11 million, but only part of that went to Belmont State. Oh, yeah. What happened to the rest of it? The rest of it went to the corporation. His corporation, his investment was 11 million. He sold shares in that to other people. He had, it wasn't that he was sole, it wasn't sole ownership. Now Belmont was a magnificent businessman and I didn't get too far into this, but I'll tell you what he did. A corporation, his corporation, who was going to build the Cape Cod Canal. So he has one corporation. Now he has to pay a company a construction company to dig it. So what do you think he did? He set up his own construction company. <laughs> so his company paid his company to do that work. But he had uh, he had a board of directors there involved. Yes, sir. Um, I don't think it is the widest, but uh, you might be right. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Uh, after I wrote this book, uh, one of my sons, <coughs> Andrew, came up to me and said, Dad, Dad, this is great. This is great. You did the Cape Cod Canal. Maybe next you can do the Panama Canal, and then you can do it. And I was like, you want me to become, like, the Canal King? Is that what my, that's what my writing career will be? Yeah, that's Jay North Conway. He writes about canals, you know? I said, no, thanks. Yes. Where does it start? And I don't really know where it starts. You mean the canal itself? Yeah, is there a start to the canal? Yeah, and it, it, right it cuts right across through the to the connecting Buzzes Bay with the uh, Cape Cod Bay, right there. And uh, as it follows the line uh, along Bourne, you can see it as you go. There. Have you been there? Well, I've been. I've, I've gone up and yeah, down yeah, it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. If you really want to treat some time, there is a night boat that goes up and down the canal, well lit. It's wonderful, you know, and it's not, it's not rocky or anything, and it's wonderful to get a view of the canal that way. Anything else? 
Hey, listen, uh, this has been a treat and a half for me. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much.